first newspaper, I was sent to knock on doors in a slightly run down neighborhood to talk to neighbors about why tires had been slashed in the street and the effect that vandalism was having on them. I knocked on the first door, it duly opened, and like a jack in the box, out sprang a massive dog which instantly leapt at me upon its hind legs and it was as tall as I was, barking and slavering in full attacking mode. What happened next was a bit of a blur. It was a long time ago, after all. Um, and, but I know that the dog's teeth went through my trench coat and my clothes. The teeth didn't quite make it to my skin, but I had to, I had to have the holes in my coat prepared. I wasn't hurt, but I did suffer a minor dose of shock, and I knew that I did enjoy the big cup of pots and tea that was put in my hands afterwards. On the downside, I don't think the paper ever did get the story about the tyres. Anyway, fortunately, the experience didn't put me off animals, or even mixing animals and journalism, and I've tried in my own small way over the years to bring to public attention various severe problems which otherwise would have remained hidden from you, and at least to perhaps make some of this thing. That's why I do what I do because bringing some of the worst quality in the country, indeed in the world, public attention is so important. All my working life, I've straddled the separate worlds of journalism and animal welfare, and it's not always been straightforward. One of the first, and possibly one of the worst issues that I reported on, was, was that of live exports from the UK. Indeed, while I was still on my first paper, the Dome of Express, I launched a campaign against live exports and it's to my editor's credit that he let me. Week in, week out, I wrote features explaining the sheer health to which the animals are subjected. We launched petitions and held meetings in Dover to discuss action with the backing of World, Compassionate World Farming to lobby our MPs for energy. Our group later evolved into Clean Action Against Live Exports, which still does excellent work today and credits to its credit to its members for their dogged campaigning. Finally, at last, there does, does appear to be focus on that, with government promises to end the trade. After that, reporting on animals and conservation anywhere in the media was a struggle and gave me something of, of a dilemma. I could never have built my career, specialised by specialising in a subject considered exceptionally niche. But fast forward a few years and I now find myself an independent where a culture of being a little more open to animal welfare has allowed me to expose some of the world's worst problems. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you how bad things are in some areas of farming and conservation. But I've covered the latest on issues ranging from foie gras to lion farming in South Africa, from fur farms to the use of carbon dioxide on kids, and from puffins ingesting microplastics to cruelty to reindeer. Thank you, Anna Lay, for the investigation on that this time last year. So, you may be wondering what makes a new story in terms of animal welfare. And, well, put simply, it's anything that's literally new, something that's not happened for being reported before, that people don't really know, and they would be interested in or not to learn. Big decisions, for instance, are often on news. What's not a new story is opinion or something that has been reported before. Fox hunts meet all the time around Britain to chase and to tear our wildlife apart. It's scandalous and it's illegal, but in general it's not news because it's already known that it happens. Sometimes a specific detail can make all the difference. That dolphin airing is keeping the animals in full captivity is not news, but when I found out that a tourist which is attraction in Bali they pull their teeth out, it was news. That chickens are raised on cruel factory farms isn't news, but that a supplier to specific supermarkets or fast food chains has workers who were seen maltreating the birds is news. Protests, marches, and petitions rarely make news, but they tend to happen all the time, I'm afraid. I like to expose cruelty that allows that systems allow or even endorse. I don't write about individual cases concerning excellence. And allegations that can't be proven are always difficult to But of course, wrongdoing or cover-ups by anyone in authority make an excellent story. So we 
you are prepared for such things going on behind the scenes, and I'm afraid it or not, please bring us what you know. Because I have to say, reading about animal suffering is not something that most people want to do, it's human nature. Even with a season campaign, it can often be hard. And I mean, such stories don't get anywhere near as many readers or kids as we use about politics. I want to mention the book. Or crime, or TV, or film reviews, for instance. Sorry, is that the definition of I was just saying that um, it Often stories about animal welfare don't get as many readers or hits as stories about politics or crime or TV and film reviews. Animal welfare is still generally seen as a soft subject in newsrooms around the country, which it is considered at all. Although well, some of the harrowing details and figures I see make it anything but soft from my point of view. And the relatively low level of reader engagement means that getting the go-ahead or taking the time to work on such stories is not really guaranteed when I'll certainly get a lot more hits if I write about the really poor case or tomorrow's weather or the US president saying something he's not in, part of a matter I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I would make a plea to you, when you see animal welfare news, please read and share it like mad so that editors support the in exposing what's wrong in our systems of animal farming, entertainment, and other forms of exploitation. Now, some of you may well have popped up here not to give me about me and my work, and I don't blame you for that, but to find out how you or your grandchildren or your children can get into journalism. Well, my number one tip, and this is only my opinion, is to start by getting work experience, or an in internship, I believe it's called these days. There's no substitute for it. You learn from being there with the professionals, day in and day out, and from the mistakes. And if you're lucky, you their mistakes too. But it takes time. Go to your local paper, which is an excellent place to start. I, and it's what I did, and they asked me back the following week. I was lucky. Or go to a specialist trade publication, or if you're very lucky, to your local radio station. There's more to learn about journalism than meets the eye. So expect to keep learning pretty much indefinitely for your career. But learn as much as you can and move on within 18 months to two years if you feel the need. You'll keep learning various different aspects of the job which will be going to. Work hard, don't expect to work nine to five, don't expect to get a lunch break, and don't expect to be well paid. I was interviewed recently by a lovely lady called Belle who runs an online magazine called How Now. And she asked me what gave me hope. And I said, what gives me hope is the fantastic work done by animal protection groups and organizations, big and small, many of whom are here today, whose work ranges from conservation projects worldwide to local activism shining the light on slaughterhouse holes. And of course, events such as this one give me hope, which just go from strength to strength as more of the population wakes up to the wisdom and the fun of being vegan. If you're already vegan and or an animal carer, you are a force for good in the world. So please keep it up. Thank you. I don't suppose anyone has any questions, but feel free to ask if you do. Or by the way, find me on Twitter and say hello. Mm -hmm. I'm quite <laughs>
And do you know where that statistic came from? <coughs> I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't like to comment without knowing what research was behind it. So like a good journalist, I would check out the facts behind it to check out the research behind it before I said it was true or not. Sorry. But it would be nice to think so, wouldn't it? It'd be nice to think there were two million by then. <laughs> Microplastics have a disproportionate 
quite big, so we can probably put up with my plastics in our system. But on the smaller animals and birds, he has a much more kind of effects. Say 
have you written an article about how Brexit will uh, affect animal welfare? I have. Now, funny enough, um, I relied on some people down at Oxford Research on this, and then I report on his research. Um, it was a rare one that the independent didn't want, so I took it elsewhere and published it on a website called theoptical.com. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, there were a lot of, a lot of implications. The, the thrust of it being that when, when we quit the EU, um, Britain will lose its historic influence uh, there's there's lot to be desired, of course, about our uh, farming standards in terms of animal welfare, but we have historically been a force for good in influencing other countries to improve their animal welfare standards. Um, and we'll use it in the South Africa was the first of his research. So if you, I mean, if you, if you Google it, look for the article.com.